Glad you guys are here. I'm thankful all the world's problems have been solved. <laughs> that everybody's on track now. We're not worried about anything at all. Uh, there's nothing happening out there, so you're so bored with life and the world and governments and North Korea. You say North Korea? Yeah, they sent 3,000 soldiers over to Russia to get it on Ukraine, and that, that happened today. Just letting you know. You say, well, is that good news? That's not good news. That's not good news. But we're not here to talk about that, are we? We, we need to actually share some good news. You know what good news is? The Lord Jesus. So we are going to talk about the gospel tonight. That's good news. You know what else is good news? You're saved only because of Christ. You're only saved because of Christ. God's grace, God's grace. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can pay. No commandments to keep. No some kind of repentance where you have to go and tell everybody you're sorry. No, you receive the gift. That is repentance when you turn around following yourself. You follow Christ. It's all by grace. You want some more good news? What you do in grace matters. Now, if you get the cart before the horse, you'll be all messed up. You'll just be trying to be religious, and then you'll give up on that and hit the bars or something and say, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I'm just saying you have to make sure that you get the, the right horse before the cart. That horse is the Lord Jesus. He's the one that pulls the wagon. He, he did it all at the cross of Calvary. And then you receive it. And then you find out what you do in grace matters. The more you cooperate in grace, and that's a decision you make, the more you cooperate, the easier it will be for you to be sanctified. Well, what if I don't cooperate? Oh, you'll still get sanctified. It's just going to be harder for you. So it's just easier to say yes at the beginning and say, okay, if God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. That's not to get into heaven. That's because you're going to heaven. You guys are tracking with me, right? Because if I don't kind of spell that out, you're going to get all messed up in the sermon tonight. Because most of the sermon, 99% of the sermon is what we do with and for Christ after we're saved. I just don't want to miscommunicate because some of us are old and we get confused really quick. So it's the faithful man, the faithful woman abounding with blessings. The faithful man, the faithful woman, that's in Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can be faithful. Oh, but then when you cooperate, you will be abounding in blessing. What do you mean by that? Life will go easier for you. North Korea is going to do what they're going to do. China's going to do what they're going to do. Russians are going to do what they're going to do. But your personal blessing will abound. I'm not talking about money. Not necessarily talking about health. I'm just saying your life will be a blessing because you got, okay, that's the sermon. Thank you for coming. Okay, now let me back it up. Let's start in 2 Timothy today, tonight. 2 Timothy, we'll be back in Proverbs in just a moment. But if you can find 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, and you say, Pastor Bill, why did you pick this portion? Well, we read it this morning in our scripture reading, and it just struck me again that Hey, that'd be good to start the sermon with. So faithful men and women abounding with blessing. So that's, that's a cue for you guys to get, uh, turn in your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. And you say, well, it's on the screen. That's for the guys online. That's not for you. If you're so lazy, you can't open your Bible. Well, then we have to have a conversation. Because <laughs> I've told you before, don't ever trust the preacher if he's not saying it right out of the Bible. The way it goes, Okay. I think we're going to have fun tonight. <clears throat> I think we are. I don't know. I know what's coming. <laughs> Buckle up. Anyways. Um, so 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Can I get you guys to stand for the scripture reading tonight? Remember the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. We saw last Sunday where he picked up Timothy. He's a disciple. Matter of fact, he's the number one disciple of the Apostle Paul. And so the last letter the Apostle Paul writes in his life is 2 Timothy. And he says, you therefore, my son. Timothy is like flesh and blood. He's like a son to the Apostle Paul. He's a spiritual son, but like my son. 
You therefore, my son, be strong. Timothy, Grace Church, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice that's, that's, that's the foundation for everything. Be strong in the grace, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's all by grace. It's all in Christ Jesus, not about Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Be strong, Grace Church, be strong. Everybody out there on radio right now, we're live on Radio by Grace across the country. Everybody on YouTube. I met a waitress today at a rest, restaurant. I didn't mean to, I'll, I'll forget if I don't throw this down. I, I didn't know her, but she says, I watch you all the time on YouTube. I said, it's better in person. She said, I know, I know. I said, well, I'm glad you're watching on YouTube. It was really cool. I left her a good tip. So, <laughs> hey, <I'm, laughs> You therefore, hey, my son, Grace Church, my brothers and sisters, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. But it doesn't stop there. Your life's not over. And the things which you've heard from me, Timothy, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Find some faithful men, find some faithful women, commit the things that I've taught you. You want to give it to the faithful. By the way, you guys are here on a Wednesday night. You're the faithful ones. I'm not saying that the rest that should be here. Aren't, I'm just saying for you to come on Wednesday night, you're tapped into something. And that person is Christ. So what, what do we need to know about the faithful ones? Verse 3, you must endure hardship. Nobody said amen. Everybody's life must be easy. Nope. We all got stuff. And it says, you must, you must, therefore you must, you therefore must endure hardship. Notice, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare, now wait, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And you say, I didn't sign up for that. I want to just coast into heaven. Maybe swing into heaven. Maybe just get raptured out of here and make it easy. I don't want to endure hardship. I don't even want to do that as a plumber. Are you kidding me? As a soldier? A soldier? Well, who enlisted me into this deal? Uh, God did. God did. Well, I don't want warfare. Well, guess what? You're already in it. You say, I'm not fighting with anybody. Oh, really? All that stuff you think is coming from people is coming from mm -hmm, the devil. No, they just hate me. You know, they hate you because of the devil. Amen. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but all that stuff that we can hardly even imagine is trying to mess you up. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Put on the full armor of God and we go to war. That's why you were enlisted. It's not so you get into heaven, know that you're a faithful man, a faithful woman, and you realize, wow, that's why. Hold on, hold on. There's another illustration here. We need to understand the soldier one. Verse 5, and also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. I met a Denver Bronco fan here on the front row, and uh, right away we know that it's easy for the Broncos to win. They just go out there and they win. <laughs> only if they're on and they play according to the rules and stay in boundaries and all that stuff hey you're not only a soldier you're an athlete that's why you should run to win you should run to win I've told you before I'll tell you again grace, grace, grace drop the G you're in a race you're in a race you say I don't want to be in a race well you're in a race not against me not against anybody you're in a race against yourself finish your race why? Drop the art. You'll be an ace. You'll be an ace. Well, who cares if I'm an ace or not? God does. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What you do matters because you're already in. You're already in. If you don't. Now, if you don't know Jesus, then that's another whole sermon. You need to get saved. If you've never said yes to Jesus, don't even listen to the sermon. Just be convicted by the Holy Spirit that you need Jesus. But if you know Jesus, buckle up. It's warfare. Start running. It is a race. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer must first partake of the crops. Consider what I say. May the Lord give you, Grace Church, everybody on radio, everybody on YouTube, may the Lord give you understanding in all things. 
translated, what you do in Jesus Christ matters. Amen. You weren't just picked to go to heaven. You were picked, chosen by God to go to war. You were picked, chosen by God to run a race. You were picked, chosen before anything was to be a hardworking farmer and enjoy the produce of your own hard work. Oh, you mean I count? You count. The faithful man, the faithful woman will be abounding in blessing. Hey, we're going to pray, but I'm going to do one thing real quick, real quick. We got a whole bunch of visitors here tonight. So Grace Church, be nice. Life Challenge, would you guys raise your hands back there? Life Challenge is all here tonight. And uh, woo! it's kind of like I, I got Amen Choir right there. Amen Corner right there. So don't throw hymn books or anything at me. Just amen. Father, thank you for your word tonight. I pray, I pray we'd have teachable hearts. I pray that we could, <clears throat> that we could sense the value that you place on us. I mean, you gave your only begotten son. He died for us. How much you love us, Lord. But, but sometimes we fall into that trap that well, I guess I don't count very much or I guess I failed too much or I guess I never got, whoa, whoa, whoa. Grace means we get to have a redo right now. Whatever today and yesterday and so far, that, Lord, we can start afresh because, because of your son, the power of your spirit, what your word's going to tell us tonight. And so let us fight this good fight. Let us run our race, Lord, as to win. Let us be that hardworking farmer. What we plant in the ground, Lord, it comes up. It does. So I thank you for grace. I thank you for all these people. Bless them, bless them, Lord. Your Holy Spirit might fall upon us. Give us teachable hearts with your word tonight, I pray, that Jesus might receive the honor and glory and all of God's people would say, okay, everybody. We are in Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. We're coming toward the end of the book of Proverbs. It's been a great study for us. Um, Proverbs, in one way, is an easy book to preach. In another way, it's so hard to preach Proverbs because it has so many different subjects. It's hard to tie it together. Like, what should I try to tie all these verses together, you know, with, with what theme? Well, Jesus Christ is the foundation. But I, I noticed in Proverbs 28, verse 20, and we'll get there, but let me go right to that verse and show you where I got the at least the sermon title for tonight, Proverbs 28 and verse 20. It says, a faithful man, a faithful woman, a faithful man will abound with blessings. Wow. That's what Timothy said. Entrust these things to faithful men. That's what Paul said to Timothy. A faithful man, if you are a faithful man, a faithful woman, you will abound. Can, you, can I hear you say abound? abound? I like that word. Abounding. You're going to be abounding. With blessing. I, I actually like that word. Do you like that word, blessing? Yeah. It's a whole lot better than cursing. Yeah. I'd rather it be abounding with blessing instead of curses. What do I have to be? You have to be a faithful man, a faithful woman. We're talking about because you are saved. You get to live a life. The world's not going to live it. Nobody else is going to live this except the people that know Lord, that know God. Here's a hint. Don't expect your politicians to live it. They ain't going to do it. There might be one or two, maybe maybe two. I don't know if there's more than two. But anyways, that's a completely different wavelength. Don't expect the world leaders to be faithful men. You, <laughs> you might have one or two, maybe. But God's people that believe this book, God's people empowered by his spirit, you get a choice. You want to be faithful or just not? If you're faithful man or woman, you're going to abound with God's blessing. You say, what is that? It doesn't matter what it is. It's good. Amen. It's good. It's like really good. 
Well, I have a bunch of money. Well, you might. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, I have perfect health. And you won't have perfect health. You won't. Until you get a perfect body. But you might have better health. I, I don't know. That's up to God. It'll be a blessing. Will my children come back to me? Oh, I don't know. But you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. You will have a abounding, blessed life. But he who hastens to be rich, uh-oh, we'll talk about that when we get there. In case you want to make yourself get rich, will not go unpunished. Uh-oh, uh, we're going to learn about the rich tonight. It happens several times in our passage. And you say, what about riches? Ooh. It has a lot to say. Your Bible has a lot to say about money. Well, you know, that guy watching TV, man, he tells me to give 10 bucks, I'll get 100 bucks back. Uh, that guy's lying to you. Well, you can't outgive God. That guy's telling you the truth. You cannot outgive God. But I don't know how he's going to get back to you. And that's not just talking about money. That's talking about your life, your service, your efforts. It'll be the bound in life. Okay. Chapter 28, verse 11. This is where we left off last week. The rich man... If I were a rich man, uh, too many people sing that song. There's people in the room who have no idea what I was just singing. You are too young to know Fiddler on the Roof, but the rich man is wise in his own eyes. That's not good. The rich, the rich man is proud. He's arrogant. He's wise in his own eyes. Yeah, look what I did. Look how much I got. I'm out doing everybody else I went to junior high with. Yeah. Man, I, I must be pretty smart. I must have played the right stock market game. I must be, I must be better than everybody else. The rich man or woman is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding, wisdom, searches the rich dude out. There's a lot of poor people that understand a whole lot better than a lot of people that are rich. Uh, maybe before I go any further, I should remind all of you that you're all stinking, filthy rich. Amen. You say, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. No, I stay at Life Challenge. You are stinking, filthy rich compared to people, half the people on this planet. So I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but in case you say, well, I'm just poor. <laughs> what, you make 50 cents a day? That's poor. But the poor who has understanding searches the rich out. Can I, just to remind you guys, can I see Mark chapter 4, verse 18? Mark chapter 4, I thought of this today. Now, these are the ones sown amongst the thorns. Jesus had this parable. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world. These are people that hear the word. But the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches. Can I hear you say deceitfulness of riches? Well, this is deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. You guys don't desire other stuff, do you? Oh, yes, you do. You're just like me. <laughs> the desire for other things. Entering in choke the word. I mean, this ground is full of weeds. It chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. You don't want to be ground number three. You don't. You don't. And it's the riches of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. See, having all the money that people think they can get is not always a good thing so i'm not trying to make you feel bad in case you have some money i just want you to know you're blessed don't think you're the one that figured it out somehow don't let it go to your head um can i see philippians chapter four philippians chapter four not that i speak in regard to need paul says for i've learned in whatever state i am to be content oh this is so key 
And so right here, you need to know the apostle Paul learned whatever state you're in right now, Paul learned how to be content. You say, I got nothing. Paul learned how to be content. I'm hungry. Paul learned how to be content. Because Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. The whole key to that, he says, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned to be content. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned how to be content. Whatever state. So right here, whatever state you're in, Paul's been in that. Only you're not as bad as Paul. I mean, he got beaten and shipwrecked and all that stuff. But he knew how to be content. He knew how to be, he learned how to be content. When, when you learn that, then it doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. It doesn't matter whether you're in prison or not in prison. It doesn't matter if you're floating around treading water or if you're on the top of the mask going, hey, I win. It doesn't matter. He's learned that whatever state he's in, he's learned how to be content. I don't know about you, but that's abounding. That's abounding. And then you got the kicker verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do not put that tattoo on your chest thinking that you can go out there and do all things. In the context, that means you can do all things being content. Content. It doesn't mean that somehow you can do all things. No, you can do all things to be content in whatever state. Do you see how context is so important to that verse? Because a lot of people are still trying to make the football team on the Broncos. Hey, I memorized the verse. I mean, you just get a little rut. You're not going to make it. Verse or no verse. Oh, but if you have that verse, you'll be content. Even if you play for the Chiefs. Got you. No, I got, I got her right there. <laughs> See, I, listen, I got you. <laughs> oh, we just lost a member. Anyways. <laughs> and a youth pastor. So they cheat anyways. I don't know. <laughs> I stop. I, I didn't, I wasn't, okay. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> uh, by the way, whether you have much or little, it's, it's God. It's God. If you have much, God gave it to you. You're not smart enough. If you have much, you get to give much. It's God's. If you have nothing, well, it's God's. It's God's. You're God's. No, I didn't say you are God's. You are God's. <laughs> Nah, that's not going to translate good, but you guys got it. Okay, verse 12, moving along. Oh, I do remember way back in the day, I was in the mayor's house. This is a long time ago. This mayor's already in heaven. But he has his own little mansion in, in Amarillo. And I got to go to his, his mansion kind of thing because I was doing youth group. And believe it or not, when our church was really, really small, I was the youth pastor, janitor, Cindy ran the nursery and kids stuff. And But anyways, the Wednesday night I was doing youth group, and it was in this house, a big old house, and a little tiny youth group. Then afterwards, I'm just sitting there with the mayor. And I felt sorry for him. I mean, I'm living in a little tiny house on West 11th. But he was just a lonely man. Lonely. You could feel it. We're all blessed. And you say, well, I'm alone. No, you're not. You're in a room full of people. In case you don't know it, we're family here. And uh, verse 12. When the righteous rejoice, when the righteous rejoice, yes. When the good guys, the people that know Jesus... When the righteous rejoice, there is great glory. Can I hear an amen? amen? When the righteous rejoice, there is great glory. Oh, but when the wicked arise, men just go and hide themselves. Man, the good old days when people really did love the Lord and people loved one another and everybody rejoiced. And now it's just like, who's running the show? Can I see what Guzik says on that verse? Please. When those who live with wisdom and righteousness, when those who live with wisdom and righteousness rejoice because of the condition of their community, it is good for everyone. Even wicked men don't want to be ruled by other wicked men. A culture may live off the inheritance of the previous righteous generation. Don't miss that. A culture... I would say a country may live off the inheritance of a previous righteous generation. But when the wicked arise, 
those benefits and freedoms righteousness brings will slowly, slowly diminish. I'm just a spoiled baby, baby boomer brought up, you know, in the late 50s and 60s. I can't imagine Scott Davey and his generation, the greatest generation. Because I know as a baby boomer just looking like, you know, hey, what, what happened to Mayberry? What happened to Andy? <laughs> Where's Aunt B? Hey. <laughs> hey. That's over. It's over. What happened? Somewhere, somewhere, the greatest generation, baby boomers, we spoiled everything because we're just a bunch of spoiled brats. Old ones now. And then come here the Zers, the Xers, the Wires, and and who's the fault? Who's to blame? The devil. By the way, Amarillo, I believe, still has a good vibe to it. We have some of Mayberry left over. But I've lived in this town 45 years. It's not what it used to be. So are you trying to be negative? I'm just saying, you know what? Righteous people, let it shine. Let it shine. Because inside this building on this corner, we're having a good time. We are having a good time. Why? Because righteousness of Christ uh, rules the day. So, verse 13, he who covers his sin will not prosper. Well, what do you mean? You're going to hide it somewhere. You can get rid of it. He who covers his sin will not prosper. Well, where'd you get that idea? Huh? The garden, Adam and Eve, <laughs> fig leaves. That didn't work. He who covers his sin, they're not going to prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean we have to confess all this stuff to God? Listen, listen, you repent when you believe in Christ. That just means you turn around. There might be some stuff that you do have to confess. There might be some stuff you don't. I don't know. That's between you and God. But there might be a situation where you need to get things straightened out with people you ripped off or wounded or whatever. It all depends on the person. Well, I'm just going to hide it. I'm not going to tell them. Ah, uh, really? So confession is a part of it, but for the most part for us, if I'm just saying for us, it's more 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Can I see 1 John 1, 8 through 10? And you guys know this passage. If we say we have no sin, this is written to believers, believers. If we say, well, I don't have any sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess, there's the word. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in Christ, you're already cleansed, but we're talking about fellowship. We're talking about getting along. We're talking about having abundant life today. And if you're just going to try to cover your sins, well, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to say I'm sorry to anybody. I'm just not. I'm not. I'm not. You're not going to have an abundant life. Well, I don't mess up like you mess up, Pastor Bill. You probably don't. I mess up a lot. A lot. You know what I have to do a lot? I have to confess a lot. Who do you confess to? <laughs> Lucinda Joy. <laughs> Lucinda Joy. She lives with me more than anybody else. That's who I mess up with. A lot. Well, you know, I'll just do the quiet routine on her for three days. Well, now you're messing up on that too. And then she's crying. I'm talking about like, what, 45 years ago. And then you, you learn. It, it's just easier to confess it. Messed up. I messed up. I'm sorry. I was, I was, I was, well, you know. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong. It's like you and the Lord. The Lord knows, and you can try to hide it on him. You can't. And then you say, something's, something's not right. Well, you need to confess that. He already knows. Confess it. Be back in fellowship. Well, I'm not going to lose my salvation. No, but you lost <laughs> fellowship. 
a good time, an abundant day. Man, if you can't make it right with your wife or your church or your Lord, wait, wait till you mess up with the world. Then you have to walk back in a restaurant or a bank or a neighbor and say, I was, <laughs> I was wrong. And then they say, you bet you were wrong. <laughs> oh, I've had to do that too. I was listening to Ed Taylor on the way in here. He was live on the radio. And my pastor, Ed Taylor, I think told a cat joke or something. He must have, because then somebody called up and said, you know, my cat died. And Ed's going, oh, boy, I'm so sorry about your cat. Is my cat going to be in heaven? Well, I don't know. We can talk about that, but he still walked through. And then all of a sudden, I heard Ed Taylor nationwide say, you know, I'm really sorry about the cat joke. I, I shouldn't have told the cat joke because it messed you up or whatever. And he was sincere. If you wound somebody, make it right. He said, what's their fault? Your witness. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them, the sin will have mercy. Amen. Amen. I remember one time, I was in Bible college, and my brother might remember this story. I mean, I was in Bible college. Uncle Paul was at the house. I think Uncle Wayne was there. And the night before, something came up about nuclear weapons. This is all up in Colorado or something. Oh, I'd already moved to Amarillo. And somebody said, what about Pantex? Now, this is 40-some years ago. But, you know, sometimes you just kind of want to Throw it down to show your uncle and your dad and your brother you're still one of the guys kind of thing. It's just stupid. And they said, well, what do you think about that? And I said, blow them all to hell. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't swear. There is a hell. But I was profane because I said, just smoke them. Blow them to hell. And I thought, you know, that just sounds so good. Do you know what the Holy Spirit did to me? <laughs> Do you know my uncle, my dad? I don't know if Doug remembers. You know, I was like, whoa, what happened to Bill? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I remember it so much because I couldn't sleep that night. I went to sleep and God said, did you really say, I don't know what to do. You need to confess. I don't want to confess it. You need to confess it. Oh, man. And then finally, when you say, okay, so the next morning at breakfast, I'm there saying, hey, you know, um, what I said about blowing everybody to hell, well, I got convicted. And, and then they're all embarrassed that I'm trying to confess to them. I just say, <laughs> confess. And then learn to control your mouth. Oh, boy, Lord. Lord. I guess we should move on to verse 14. Okay, <laughs> verse 14. Here we are. Happy. Can I hear you say happy? happy. Uh, you want the happy. You want the happy light. You want the, want the blessed life. Happy, blessed. Happy is the man. Happy is the woman who is always reverent. What? Because when you read the word reverent, you think, oh, man. But... The, it's just happy. If you want to be happy all the time, who is always in fear of the Lord? Amen. Happy is the man who's always trembling before the Lord. There, there is a respect. There's a reverence. And, and I know he's our best friend. He's our best friend. The, the Holy Spirit's our best friend. The, the Lord is our friend. He is. Yeah. Yahweh Elohim is Abba, Father. We, he's our daddy. Yeah. But there should always be a holy fear. Yeah. If you want to be happy. Yeah. Now, if you don't want to be happy... <laughs> Honk if you love Jesus. 
You know, like, that's fine for a bumper sticker, but there's got to be more to your life than honking for Jesus. There's a reverence. There's a respect. There's a quietness. And part of that is that if he says it, that's what I'm going to do. The, the older I get with the Lord, the more I'm, I'm just quiet with the Lord. Just quiet. Just quiet. He talks to me, not with words, with his word. And to be reverent, to be like, well, I'm going to try to read my Bible while I drive my car. Mm, don't do that. I'm going to try to do it and listen to YouTube at the same time. Don't do that. Respect, reverence, happy. But he who hardens his heart, anybody who hardens his heart, will fall into calamity. I, I don't want that. That's not good. So what is it? You just have to respect the Lord. Don't harden your heart. Morgan would say this. Can I see Morgan? The man who shuts his eyes to God gathers himself up and desperately plunges forward. Well, he's no hero. He's a fool. And without exception, sooner or later, lands himself in circumstances which break him and brings about and brings those about him into suffering and catastrophe. In other words, if you're just so hard-hearted, you're not including God, and you think you can rush ahead, you're going to fall into calamity. You are. Meet with your Lord. Verse 15. Like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. Like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler. over poor people. Can I see Ross on that one? Because tyrants are like this animal imagery, beast imagery, is used in Daniel. It's used in Daniel chapter 7, 1 through 8, for a series of ruthless world rulers. The poor crumble under such tyrants because they cannot meet their demands. By the way, Daniel was written 2,400 20, years ago. It's coming true right before your eyes. On that same subject, subject of a ruler, a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked is like a, a wicked ruler over his poor people. They're like lions and bears. A ruler, a ruler who lacks understanding. A ruler that isn't smart is a great oppressor. I, I might say on that one, IQ matters. But he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. So before you think of whatever rule, world ruler or potential world ruler or whatever you think, that's fine. But where it gets personal, he or she who hates covetousness can I hear you say the word hates? Yes. Covetousness. Well, I just want to think about some lions and tigers and bears right now. I just want to think about some people that don't have any IQ at all. You know, and who knows what's going to happen with them? And they, well, you can do that, or you can look personally at your own heart. Because guess what? You can't do anything about the guy in China or North Korea or Russia. 
But you can watch your own heart. So before you score somebody else that you have hardly any influence at all on, at best you got one vote. Use it. And then hate covetousness. You say, where's, where'd you get that? It says it right there. He who hates covetousness will prolong his days. Now, that interests me since I'm 69 years old. How can I have a longer life? <laughs> that really interests Scott Davy. <laughs> How can Scott prolong his life? And if you're young, like some of the people on the front row, it should interest you. How can I have a longer life? Well, no way. I thought the Bible says your hairs on your head are numbered. So it's kind of already in the box. Well, in one sense it is, but it says right there, it can prolong your days. Does it not say that? By the way, honor your mom and your dad, you'll live a longer life. It's in the book too. So which verse is true? Well, they're both true. Your days are numbered, but if you hate covetousness, you will prolong your days. So, I, hey, that sounds like a vitamin I want to take. You know, what do I have to do? <laughs> One of the hardest things there is to do. Hate covetousness. Well, exactly what does that word mean? I'm glad you asked. I looked it up. Covetousness, the greedy desire to have more. The greedy desire to have more. What was that Paul said? I've learned to be content in all things. You say, well, why are you picking on us? I'm just reading 16, and this is where we're at. Uh, Jesus had something to say about this. Can I see Luke 12, 15? Luke 12, 15. Jesus said to them, take heed, beware of covetousness. Can I hear you say beware? Listen up, you better beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in abundance. It does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Beware. Oh, but you got to see my garage. It's all full of stuff. I yeah, know. Beware. I need a storage unit because it doesn't all fit in the garage. Beware. I'm just going to get rid of all that stuff and get more stuff. Beware. Paul had something to say in Romans 7, 7. Can I see that? Romans 7, 7. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? Ah, oh, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Can, can I just bust the bubble for a second? And everybody in this room covets. We have to learn how to hate it. Everybody in this room, I'm, if you're the exception, then I'll, I'll, I'm lying, I'll repent. But I bet everybody in the room wants more and more and more and more of the same stuff you already have, have, have. Lord, Ephesians 5.3, can I see that? But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, Man, you mean he's right there with sexual sins and uncleanliness? Or covet let it not even be named amongst you as it's fitting for saints. Yeah. Does he Hebrews 13, 5? Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Cindy, I hope I tell the story right, but last week you had an illustration in the women's Bible study, and it, it struck me. This rich lady from New York, some apartment in her house, and she left New York City, and she went to Jerusalem, and she heard about a rabbi, and she wanted to look him up. So she found his address, and so she shows up at his address his little house there and she goes in and he's got just like one room and all the rabbi had this is a famous rabbi all the rabbi had was a bed a table a chair and a desk that's it and so the rich lady when she goes in and she meets the rabbi that she'd been looking forward to she said where's all your stuff 
You have a bed and a table, a chair and a desk. Why don't you have more stuff? And he looked at her and said, well, where's your stuff? And she said, well, it's back in New York and I've got somebody watching it. But she said, I don't have it with me because I'm traveling. And he looked right at her and he said, I'm traveling. Hate, covetousness will prolong your days. Verse 17. A man burdened with bloodshed. That is not good. A man burdened with bloodshed will flee into a pit or a tunnel or a cave. A man just burdened. He's going to kill and murder and destroy. I'll get him, get him, get him. A man burdened with bloodshed will flee into a pit. Let no one help him. Can I see Clark? (laughs) He who either slays the innocent or procures his destruction may flee to hide himself but let none give him protection. The law demands his life because he is a murderer and let none deprive justice of its claim. Can I see bridges? Yet we must not cast out his soul. Visiting the condemned cell is a special exercise of mercy. While we bow to the stern justice of the great lawgiver, that would be God himself. Joyous indeed it is to bring to the sinner under the sentence of the law, the free forgiveness of the gospel. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Not as annulling his sin, but showing the overabounding of grace beyond the abounding of sin. Oh, you're determined to murder and kill and destroy, and now you hide out in a tunnel, a pit, a cave. God have mercy on your soul. I couldn't help but when I read those quotes in that verse, think of the guy on the cross next to Jesus. Who was the paying a price for what he had killed and destroyed and stolen, but died a forgiven forgiven sinner in, in the presence of God with Jesus on the spot. And why it's so quiet in the room? You're all thinking of a bunch of people who premeditate we're going to go kill, rob, destroy, and murder. And then they hide out in tunnels underneath hospitals and schools and behind babies. We indeed live at biblical times. It is not boring. It is not. Amen for grace. Verse 18. Whoever walks blamelessly 
will be saved. Now, right away, in the context of that, it's not talking about your salvation. And by the way, it's not talking about perfection. Nobody walks in perfection. Nobody does. But we are expected to walk blamelessly. In other words, if somebody looks at the integrity of your life, are you a man of your word? Are you a woman of your word? Is your yes, yes, your no, no? Are you cooperating? Are you a good citizen? Do you pay your taxes? Are you blameless? Like Daniel. Daniel was blameless. The only thing they could get on him was praying, which, by the way, they're trying to outlaw that in different parts of our country and the world. Well, you can make it a law, but guess what? You're still going to pray. Daniel opened up the window. That's so everybody could see him so that he could look east when he prayed. Hmm. Whoever walks blamelessly will be saved, will be delivered. But he who is perverse in his ways will suddenly fall. Can I see Guzik on verse 18? The one who is twisted and crooked in his dealings can't expect God's blessing and protection. That crooked, twisted person should expect to suddenly fall one day. In other words, do things correct. Do it right. Philippians 2, 14 through 15 says this. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And we live there. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Don't get in fights. Don't dispute. Just be nice. Walk in integrity. Be blameless. Verse 19. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. In other words, you work, you'll get a harvest. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows... Oh, Nick, where are you? What, say that word for me. Say it again. Ferality. Thank you. I don't want to be frivolous about anything, but I can't say that word. But he who follows, and that is frivolous, will have poverty enough. In other words, work hard, you'll have a harvest. Can I see what Ross says on that verse? There is a meaningful repetition here. The diligent person will have plenty of bread, but the lazy person will have plenty. It's the same Greek word, hibas, will have plenty of poverty. I mean, it, it, that is actually hidden, not hidden, but it's in the Hebrew of that verse. Can I see bridges on that verse? If we are not to be lazy in business, but fervent in spirit in this world, in all of its concerns, how much more, how much more? We need to be like this in the momentous concerns of eternity. In other words, if you have to be this way as a citizen, as a worker, as somebody, you know, that's blameless, how much more as a worker should we be involved with the harvest that's coming? That's why we do church, not to keep just us happy. No, there are people to reach. Verse 20, it's where we started. A faithful man will abound with blessing. What's that look like? All the verses we've talked about and the rest of Proverbs. A faithful man will abound with blessing, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Can I see Garrett on that verse? Well, not condemning possessions in themselves... Proverbs will reject, always rejects greed. Greed. It contrasts financial prudence, diligence, and generosity with the desire for quick and easy money. Don't do that. Don't do that. The one who hastens to be rich, figuring out, scheming, making a chart, all the stuff, uh, they're going to be punished. Verse 21, to show partiality is not good. To show partiality, to play favorites is not good. It's not good. It's not good. Because for a piece of bread, a man will transgress. You you don't get to pick favorites. You don't. We should be impartial because partiality is not good. Guzik would say this on that verse. In the court of law or in our daily dealings with people, we should not show partiality. We should be those who do not favor or condemn others based on their race, class, 
nationality, or influence. 1 Timothy 5.21 says what? I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angel that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. In other words, you don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to pick and choose who's in your church. You don't get to pick and choose who lives in this city. You, you live out your life not showing partiality. You don't get to play favorites. I mean, we can tease about the Broncos and the Chiefs, and we, we get that. But when it comes to people, when it comes to people, be very, very careful because there are ones trying to do partiality. They, they, they actually score it. Jesus was very careful in Luke 20, 45 through 47. Luke 20, 45 through 47. Then in the hearing of all the people, Jesus said to his disciples, beware, beware of those scribes, beware of them who desire to go around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at the feasts who devour widow houses. They devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, they make long prayers. These will receive a greater condemnation. It's interesting. Go back into Ezekiel, and you'll see there is a special judgment on prophets and prophetesses who are very partial in what they want to say to people to get stuff out of them. Very, very specific. You don't get to pick. Okay, last verse. You guys are still okay, right? Okay, last verse for tonight. Verse 22. Dun, da, da, da. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches. Oh, no, there it is again. A man with an evil eye tries to figure out. He hastens. He's going for the money and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. So many times people are trying to get rich, all the schemes, whatever, and then they end up in, po in poverty. Guzik would say on that verse... Because God's blessing does not rest on the stingy, ungenerous man. Poverty will come upon him, and he will not consider or expect it. Last quote by Walkie is, The Lord will see to it that only consciousness, conscientious, the Lord will see to it that only conscientious and compassionate people finally hold wealth in his kingdom. Amen. We are rewarded in heaven. And he's not talking about how many dollars, it's how many cities you get to rule over. It's really a big deal. It's like we're all in college right now. We're all got this first job going on right now. The, the big, big, big position in Helping him reign and rule over the earth. And you really want to do this one right. It's all by grace. But the way you handle your money, the things, your life, the way you treat people, the way you confess, the way you pray, the way you take one thought from all these verses. You know, I don't expect you guys to remember all the stuff we talked about. There should have been one thought, one thought. That I, I need to get that one right. I, can, I need to get that right. I need to get that right. By God's grace, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right. We'll be faithful. And you'll be blessed. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray. Here's what we're going to pray for in the next five minutes. I'll start us off. Israel, the elections, we're right in the middle of that. And that we might be faithful men and women with the whole world upside down that we might be faithful men and women. Father, thank you for your word tonight. We do thank you that all of it is based on the grace of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross at Calvary, Lord, and he took our place. And in, in him, in Christ, we can now run our race, have the warfare, be the farmers that are pleasing to you, 
So Lord, help us to make that adjustment. Help us, especially when it comes to covetousness and greed and money. Oh Lord, may we be quick to confess to you and anyone else anything that would get in the way of our walk with you or them. 